Good morning and welcome to the Coordinating Council on Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention quarterly meeting. My name is Elizabeth Wolf and I am the designated federal official for this Federal Advisory Committee meeting. With that, I'd like to open the meeting officially and turn it over to Karen Harp, Administrator of the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. Good morning, everyone. So nice to have you here. Uh, and I think it's on. I think it's on. You can hear me, can't you? Okay. I'm sure you can hear me. Okay. Um, first, welcome to the meeting. We're delighted to have you. Uh, just a little bit of uh, kind of housekeeping business. I think you've been receiving some emails from Elizabeth Wolf uh, about partnerships, existing partnerships that you have with federal agencies to, uh, that are youth-centered in some way. And you all were going to provide us a list of those existing uh, partnerships. It, it doesn't, you don't have to be the lead agency. It doesn't have to be um, even something that takes a lot of time. Maybe you're just funding it in partnership with another agency. But we had asked for that list, and so far, we want to congratulate Brenda, Brenda <laughs> Gesto from HHS. <laughs> uh, or Lisa, yeah, for being the only agency that has responded to our request. So, um, please, I, I really wasn't kidding about that. That's useful information to us, and we're going to take that and um, build on it uh, in the future. So I, we really need you to go ahead and uh, get us that information, and we need to have it before the next uh, coordinating council meeting. So that's, that's just a little bit of uh, how we're keeping. Let's see, is there anything else that is pressing right now? Can we go ahead and get started? All right, let's get started. We have great, we have two great presentations for you today. One is from the Department of Education, and one is actually from 4-H uh, National Mentoring Program. I'm excited about both of these. Uh, the first will be a presentation highlighting opportunities for federal partnerships supporting delinquency and intervention uh, for youth and Fatima Mohammed will be presenting or moderating that panel that will include Jasmine Akinshape and uh, Elizabeth Witt and I have in some kind of on the fringe heard this presentation or at least been aware of the information that's in it and I think it's going to be really helpful to you, and we're looking forward to it. So if you would, Fatima, whenever you're ready. All right. Thank you, Karen, for that introduction. Good morning, everyone. Um, I don't know how many of you know, but the Department of Ed recently went through a reorg. And as a part of that reorg, Title I, Part D, the title program for neglected or delinquent children or youth was repositioned into a new office, the Office of School Support and Accountability, along with McKinney Vento, a program for homeless children, foster care, English learners, and for teachers and leaders. So that's Title II Part A, Title III Part A, Title I Part D, and the McKinney Vento Act. And the group is called Teachers, Leaders, and Special Populations. So that's the group I oversee, and Libby and Jasmine are the program officers for Title I, Part D. So um, Karen came to our director's meeting recently that was hosted by NDTAC, which is our technical assistance center, and she stressed the importance of us collaborating. And we are delighted to be here as a new team for this program, thinking about the various opportunities that we can have serving a special population of students. So today, our goal is to talk about Title I Part D first, just so you'll have a high level understanding as to the title program, the goals of the program, in particular subpar one. And then we will talk about the different opportunities for federal partnerships. 
I know one of our primary partners right now is the Interagency Council on Homelessness, and they, too, look forward to collaborating with us and with you because we're talking most likely about some of the same student population. In addition to that, um, internally within Ed, us working with our Office of Special Education Program because, as all of you probably know, that a lot of students who are neglected and or delinquent are probably have some type of data to support their needs and as a special education population. So um, prior to this meeting, based on Karen's attendance at our director's meeting, which was state coordinators from all across the nation that received this funding for Title I Part D, we've spoken with her team. And I think everyone was so excited just to be on the phone. We didn't even schedule the next meeting. So we, <laughs> we need to do that and think about how we're going to meet um, quarterly or by monthly, what are we going to do and what are the purposes? We, we threw a lot of ideas out, such as um, participate in each other's webinars, especially on topics that may focus on education and family to move forward. So that's one thing. Um, the second thing is we will attend the conference in Kansas City. We're looking forward to that. We'll participate in meetings and we will also present. So we have jumped in. And we're here. We're here to be equal partners at the table, and we look forward to working with all of you. We are. I just want to tell you, we are so grateful for the way you responded to that request, and for you traveling all the way to Kansas City to meet all of our state representatives out there and and share with them the information and try to make these connections to make even more effective use of those funds. I just we're so grateful to you. Thanks. Thank you for having us. Okay, so um, Libby and Jasmine will kind of tag team. Libby will start with an overview of the subpart one. We'll talk a little bit about subpart two just so you'll understand there's another component to the Title I Part D, and then we will go into various opportunities for partnership, and then we'll take a few questions. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Fatima. Um, as Fatima said, what we'd like to do before we get into a discussion of possibilities for partnerships is give you a little bit of background information about what the Title I Part D program actually does, um, how that how those funds go out to states, um, kinds of things that people are using these funds for, which may uh, give all of you some ideas for how you might be able to partner with our grantees in terms of knowing more about what they actually do. Um, as Fatima said, there are two parts to the Title I Part D program. This is Title I Part D of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which is the primary piece of federal legislation that covers K-12 education. So Title I Part D is the program that serves children and youth who are neglected and delinquent. Um, there are two subparts. Subpart one, which is mostly what we're going to be talking about today, uh, is a state agency program. It goes out to state educational agencies in the 50 states, D.C. and Puerto Rico, as a formula grant. Um, we're going to be talking primarily about subpart one today. Um, for federal fiscal year 2019, which uh, these are grant funds that just went out on July 1st, uh, the program, the, the subpart one program, was funded at $47.6 million. Um, almost all of that goes out to states as grants. We do retain a small portion at the, at the U.S. Department of Education, and that primarily funds our NDTAC Technical Assistance Center. Uh, but of that 47.6 million, 46.4 is awarded to states. Um, the state educational agencies are our grantees, so that's whatever the, the main education agency is in each state. So it's usually the State Department of Education or Department of Public Instruction. Um, in FY 2019, 49 of the 50 states received a subpart one grant, and D.C. and Puerto Rico also received subpart one funds. The one state that does not receive subpart one funds doesn't receive those funds because it administers all of its uh, neglected and delinquent programs at the, at the local level rather than at the state level. Um, we'll get to subpart two in a, in a second. Um, 
but the SEAs then make subgrants to state agencies uh, that operate educational programs for children and youth. And those children and youth can be in institutions or community day programs for children who are neglected or delinquent, but subpart one can also serve uh, students who are in adult correctional facilities. Right. Oh, yeah. Um, subpart one, uh, generally speaking, um, it varies from state to state how many state agencies there are. Some have very few, some have a lot. Um, but the number of institutions served and the number of students served in those institutions has remained fairly consistent over the last few years. 1617 is the most recent year that we currently have data for, but we don't expect that that number is going to change very much. Um, but you can see the percentages of students in uh, the different kinds of institutions that can potentially be served through subpart one. Pardon me? It says, I'm sorry. May I ask, what is a neglected institution? <laughs> There's a, a regulatory definition. It's an institution that serves students who've been, we'll get to this in a minute, but, but yeah. Um, this is actually sort of an issue for the statute. Um, the language around neglected institutions hasn't changed very much over the years. And we increasingly um, have fewer and fewer states that have agencies that meet the statutory and regulatory definition of a neglected institution. Most places have um, tried to move those students to foster situations rather than like orphanages and that kind of thing. Um, and foster uh, institutions are served elsewhere in the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. So we, we have fewer and fewer of those. So the N and D program tends to serve more the D than the N at this point. Um, and that's uh, partly a feature of the, of the statutory definitions in the program. All right, we do want to just mention very briefly that there is a subpart two. Um, we're going to be talking mostly about subpart one today, but subpart two is a local education program. Um, a local, it's administered at the local rather than the state level. Um, there's actually more funding in the local program than in the state program. It's 104.3 million in uh, fiscal year 2019. Um, it's not a separate grant to states. It goes out to them as a portion of their Title I Part A grant. Title I Part A is the program that serves school districts um, of all at-risk uh, students. Um, so each uh, state, as part of their um, Title I Part A allocation has a set aside for Title I Part D subpart two programs and then they administer those. Um, that it, like I said, it's awarded to um, the SEAs as part of their Title I Part A grant rather than as a separate program and there are 46 states that receive subpart two funds in fiscal year 2019. The, the states that don't, um, it's sort of the opposite of the states that don't receive subpart one. There's a small number of states that only do the neglected and delinquent program at the state level. They're mostly really small states where, you know, geographically it makes sense for them to run this whole thing as a state program like a, uh, rather than a regular program. The District of Columbia is one of the states, for example, that does not receive subpart two funds because they serve all of their students at the, at the state level. Um, for the subpart two funds that the states receive as part of their Title I Part A grant, they make subgrants to local educational agencies, which is Elementary and Secondary Education Act speak for school districts. Um, and those awards can be made by a formula or they, states can run those competitively and they have complete uh, discretion in terms of whether they decide to do this as a formula grant or as a competitive program. Um, but those uh, subgrants, however they're made, uh, are made to school districts to provide programs to serve children and youth who are in local correctional, oper locally operated correctional facilities, um, who attend community day programs for delinquent children and youth or um, they can also provide assistance to children and youth who are neglected or at risk of dropping out, and those services can be provided in the school district. 
Um, so we just wanted to, you know, be aware that there is this other um, program that serves neglected and delinquent children and youth, uh, but it, it's administered at the local rather than the state level. The state is obviously responsible for monitoring all of its subgrantees, but the actual work is done at the school district level. Okay. Um, in terms of subpart one, is that, did it go? Okay. Um, the subpart one, which is the, the state level program, um, subpart one grants, we make them to the state uh, based on a statutory formula. The state's annual count of neglected or delinquent students is then multiplied by 40% of the, uh, did I skip one? Sorry. Uh, program goals. Sorry about that. Um, we're having a little clicker problem here. Um, the program goals, these apply to both subpart one and subpart two. Uh, the, the goal of the program and the goal of the funds is to pro improve educational services for children and, and youth in local, tribal, and state institutions for neglected or delinquent children and youth so that they have the opportunity to meet the state's academic standards, just like students who attend school, uh, public school in a, in a school district. Um, the program can also provide children and youth with services to successfully transition from institutionalization to further schooling or employment. Um, that's a key feature of the program. And also to prevent youth who are at risk from dropping out of school and um, provide youth who do drop out and children and youth returning from correctional facilities with a support system to ensure that they can complete their education. Okay, now let's try this again. Okay, all right, so how do we award funds, the subpart one funds, to states? Um, like I said, it's a formula. Uh, it's based on the state's annual count of the number of neglected and delinquent uh, students uh, in the state. There's the data that the states report to us directly. Um, that's multiplied by 40% of the state's per pupil expenditure, which again is data that comes to us from the state. It's an average number for each state. It varies pretty widely from state to state. Uh, but anyway, they take, we take that count, we multiply it by 40% of that SPPE number and uh, essentially run it through the formula. Depending on what the appropriation is every year, we may have to rateably reduce those numbers to come up with the amount that each state gets. Um, for the last round of grants that we awarded, uh, the subgrants to the SEAs ranged in size from $86,000 to $2.6 million. Um, so the, the range is pretty wide depending on the number of NND kids in individual states. It also, of course, depends on how much each state uh, spends for that per pupil expenditure amount. Um, as far as the students who are included in that neglected and delinquent count that we use for the allocation purposes, um, that includes neglected or delinquent children age 20 or younger who are either in a state-operated adult correctional facility and enrolled in a regular program of instruction for at least 15 hours per week, or who are, in, who are in a state neglected or delinquent institution or community day program and enrolled in a regular program of instruction for at least 20 hours per week. So if they're in a youth program, 20 hours a week. If they're in an adult facility, 15 hours a week. Um, there is a statutory definition of a regular program of instruction. So what that means is an educational program, uh, not beyond grade 12. So NND does, uh, Title I Part D does not fund college uh, education that's funded. There are other ways to fund those. So this would be a regular K-12 type program. Um, in an institution or community day program for neglected or delinquent children that consists of classroom instruction in basic school subjects, such as reading, math, and career-oriented subjects, um, to be counted as a regular program of instruction, the program must be supported by non-federal funds. Um, we'll get to this a bit more later, but generally speaking, federal education funds have to supplement state and local expenditures not replace them. So the regular program of instruction that qualifies the children to be counted in the count has to be a state or locally provided, well, in this case, state provided program. And then the Title I Part D funds supplement 
the program that's already provided by the state. Okay. All right, so we make the awards to the state education agencies. They in turn make subgrants to eligible state agencies or what we refer to as FAs uh, on the basis of the state agencies proportionate share of the state's enrollment count of the NND students. So essentially it's a formula. Um, so, you know, some states have a lot of state agencies, others have maybe only one or two. Uh, how much each state agency receives depends on their share of that NND count. Um, in order to be eligible to receive uh, funds as a state agency, the state agency must be responsible for providing free public education for children and youth who are in an educational program in an NND institution, who attend a community day program for NND children, or who are in an adult correctional facility. Um, the state agency is required to submit an application to the state uh, education agency. They don't just automatically receive the funds. They have to actually apply for them. Um, there's a lengthy section of the statute that says all the stuff that needs to be in your application. It's literally like 19 things they have to address. But one of the key ones is a description of how the state agency has assessed the needs of the students that are served by subpart one. So essentially they're doing a needs assessment for the kids that they serve uh, and then clearly the, the things that they use the funds for are supposed to address the things identified in that needs assessment. But there's a lot of other stuff that goes in that application as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, one thing that's important to point out about this, uh, while the state agencies are responsible for providing free public education, they aren't necessarily the agents, the agency that actually provides the education. They're sort of responsible for administering. Um, in some states, the state agency actually is providing the education services. In other places, they may be contracting uh, with outside providers to provide the education, but they have administrative authority over the provision of the education services. Um, in terms of what types of agencies actually serve as state agencies, it really depends on the, the structure of the program in the state. Typically, it, it'll be a State Department of Corrections that operates juvenile facilities or is responsible for providing services to uh, juveniles who are in adult facilities. Um, as far as the neglected students, it may be a State Department of Youth Services, uh, but the structure really varies from state to state and depends on the way the state has structured its system or systems for serving neglected and delinquent students. In some states, the state education agency can be a state agency, in which case they're making subgrants to themselves, which is a little weird. Uh, but again, it's just a, um, who gets served through this program is sort of a byproduct of the way each state sets up its system. Um, one of the byproducts of that for us is that it can be really difficult for us to answer general questions about the program because questions tend to be really context specific to how a particular state has set itself up. Um, so, it, it, you know, we, it's hard to answer broadly questions. It, it, the answer often starts with, well, it depends on what the structure in your state is. The same is true for the subpart two programs because the locally administered programs are as widely varied as the state agencies are. All right. Okay. So, um, how they, the state agencies, however many there are and however they're set up in the state, um, a single state agency may actually allocate its subpart one funds to multiple facilities. Again, this is a feature of how, what the state agency is in a particular state. Sometimes they only have one facility, sometimes they, they may have several. Um, it varies. Uh, the state agency distributes funds to eligible institutions under its jurisdiction in accordance with the needs assessment that was part of its application. 
which may or may not be strictly based on count. Um, you know, there may be instances where a particular institution, even though it has a smaller number of students, has a higher need for whatever reason. So they don't have to do this necessarily proportionally. Um, state agencies can serve four types of eligible institutions. Uh, one is adult correctional institutions that provide persons under 21 with a regular program of instruction using state funds. Uh, institutions for delinquent children and youth, which are public or private facilities that are operated for the care of children and youth who've been adjudicated as delinquent or in need of supervision and that have an average length of stay of at least 30 days. Foster homes are specifically excluded from the definition in the statute. All right. Um, the third type of institution is institutions for neglected children and youth. These, again, can be public or private residential facilities that are operated for the care of children and youth who've been committed to the institution or voluntarily placed due to abandonment, neglect, death of a parent or guardian, and, again, have an average length of stay of at least 30 days. Again, foster homes do not qualify. Um, this is the place where I was talking about earlier where the definition hasn't really kept up with the way that most states actually provide services to neglected children. Most states have tried to the degree that they can to place those students in foster care situations rather than in orphanages. I mean, that's originally what this was kind of intended for. Um, but the definition in the statute has not changed, and foster care is specifically excluded. The fourth type of institution is a community day program, uh, which provides a regular progr program instruction provided by the state agency at a community day school operated specifically for neglected or delinquent children and youth. So those are the four types of agencies um, that get served uh, by the essays. Right. Yes, you open it. All right. Great. Thank you, Libby. So now we're going to talk about how Subpart 1 funds are used. And so uh, compared to other programs such as Title I Part A, there's a lot more flexibility in Title I Part B, but there are some limitations. And so each uh, state agency must reserve at least 15 to 30 percent for transition services. So that could in include counselors, coordinators, ensuring that students are correctly transitioning from a facility um, back into the school system. And in addition to that, SAs must use their funds to support educational services for students who are failing or at risk of failing. And then they also must use the funds to su su supplement the numbers of hours of instruction students receive from states and local resources. So this should be in addition to what they're already receiving from the state. So the common uses of funds include hiring additional staff, so that could include teachers, aides, educational counselors, and it also could include professional development for teachers and staff who provide services and the, the students in the facilities. And then some of the states also use uh, the funds for education materials and equipment. So that can include books, computers, audiovisual equipment. I know some facilities uh, use a blended learning system, so some of the students may have access to uh, tablets and things so that they, when they transition back into the school system, it's much easier for them uh, to make an easier transition. So which students receive subpart one services? So I know we mentioned subpart two earlier, and these this is where some some of the differences occur. And so subpart two does not have these differences. So for subpart one, uh, students must be, a, uh, be 21 years or younger, and they must be entitled to a free public education up to grade 12, and then they must be enrolled for at least 20 hours per week at a youth institution or a community day program, or 15 hours at an adult institution. So under certain circumstances, some institutions, some programs may not have all students that meet these requirements, but the program can still receive those funds and serve all the students within those programs. All right, so now we're going to focus on how you can partner with us and partner with uh, other facilities or, or at the national, state, and local levels. And so for us, 
we collaborate internally, and so we have four offices that we generally work with for the Title I Part D program. And so, of course, there's the Office of Elementary and Second Education, which is under Title I Part D, but it also houses Title I Part A, which, which is where the Subpart II funds come from. And then there's also the National Technical Assistance Center for the Education of Neglected or Delinquent Children Youth, NDTAC, that we mentioned earlier, that helps support state coordinators who, uh, who are part of the Title I Part D program. And then another office that uh, we collaborate is OSEP and OSERS, and under, under their office, they have the IDA, and they have Free Appropriate Public Education, or FAPE, and then they also have a Research to Practice division that they collaborate with other offices, such as DOJ and uh, as appropriate. Uh, we also work with Office of Civil Rights occasionally, and then there's the Office of Career, Technical, and Adult Education, which has Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act and Perkins V. All right, so there's a lot of levels and opportunities for partnerships that's connected to Title I Part D and then the Neglected Delinquent Program. And so at the national level, of course, there's the U.S. Department of Education, uh, the Department of Justice, OJJDP, of course, the Correctional Education Association, and NDTAC. At the regional, local level, uh, there's opportunities to work with the juvenile court system, uh, police and sheriff, technical assistance centers, and at the state level, there's opportunities to work with uh, the parent technical assistance centers, uh, special education directors, and so, and, and it goes on and on, and, and it just, just find whatever's appropriate, whoever's easier to connect with, um, whether it be a webinar, doing training, reaching out, attending events, things of that nature. Are you guys sent, um Participating in our recent webinar, oh, you're not on. Oh, am I on now? There, there it is. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> it increased the enrollment and participation in that webinar over 300 participants by sending it out to your listserv. So thank you for that. Yes, the sharing of information. Just exactly how it's supposed to work. That's outstanding. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we have events that are coming up with Title One Part D that we would love for you all to collaborate with. And so with our Technical Assistance Center, they host webinars at least three times a year. And so most recently, they had a family involvement webinar, a crossover uh, youth webinar. And so it's uh, just great places to either be a presenter or have stakeholders listen in. And so these webinars, they have recurring or special topics as we determine. And then they typically provide topical up-to-date information and support of the neglected and delinquent youth and families. And then we also, every year, we have the Title I Part D Coordinators National Conference. And that's held about May of each year. And that's where Karen was able to, to join us and, and present. And a lot of our coordinators are just very excited to have different perspectives, different departments, different people across federal organizations to participate and present and give them a, a, a bigger picture of what they can do in their state. And so state coordinators wear multiple hats, and so they may be working with homeless students. Uh, they may be working with housing. They may be doing multiple things across their state, so it's great to just connect with them as well. And so this conference is a three-day annual national meeting for state coordinators and national organizations, and it just provides an opportunity every year for them to connect with one another, uh, with federal agencies and national organizations to just really see what's working in their state, what they can approve upon, looking at their data and things of that nature. Right, here's our resources page, so if you want to collect in, any more information, if you want to direct somebody to learn more about Title I Part D or the other offices in ED, you are, feel free to access some of these links. We have the link for IndyTech and then also some links to the ED offices. All right, any questions? I know that's a lot of information at once, and it is not always the most exciting, um, but please feel free. Any question you have? We are open to I answering. I have a question. This is, this is Maura yeah. Bergen from Michigan. I have a question. I'm Brenda Destro with HHS. I'm just wondering, um, are any of these funds available for evaluation of these programs? Or how does that take place? There is an evaluation component of the programs. It's mostly happening 
with the subgrantees are required to do a certain level of evaluation of their own programs. Um, as, as I think I was, as Fatima said, we've just recently reorganized, so we're all new to this program, and we're still figuring out exactly how that works, but there is an evaluation component to the program in the statute. We're not really sure what level of evaluation people are actually doing. Um, they're not, it's not a ton of money, and, um, you know, there's always that particularly with education programs, there's that balance between knowing that evaluation is important, but also if you're spending money on evaluation and you've got limited funds, that's less that you can spend on the actual program. Uh, but, but there is an evaluation component to the program and we are um, doing some investigating and looking at um, how that actually operates on the ground. Can we ask questions from the phone? Not an area in which I have any degree of familiarity. So, uh, thank you for the excellent briefing, but I'd like to, to hear an example of uh, somebody who has implemented these funds in a way that excites you all. Some sort of pragmatic explanation. You don't have to tell me where or anything like that, but I'd like to hear an example of, of how these funds have been effectively used uh, to make some significant change on a, on a local level. Yeah, we, our NDTAC just did a webinar last week, was it last week, um, on family engagement techniques. And they had used these funds, and these were subpart one funds, it was a state uh, correctional facility, where they had really used funds to help pay transportation costs for parents and family to come um, more often and to set up programs to help the families engaging and they're finding that this is really effective at keeping the students engaged in their education program because the parents and or guardians or other adults who are involved in their lives um, are really participating in that more fully than they had been before and they found this to be a really good way to um, not only improve the education program while the kids are in the institution, but it's helpful for the transition piece as well. If the family's engaged, when the child goes back to the regular school after he or she is released, um, they're more likely to stay in if the family's engaged. So, you know, that kind of family and engagement activity has been very important for this particular institution, and they've placed a lot of focus on that. A follow-up question to that. Is it, and being from a rural area, mm -hmm. um, familiar with all of the challenges from transportation, do, in that vein, do most of these funds, are they allocated in, in rural areas? Is this more of an urban approach, uh, or fairly balanced? It depends. Um, really, that is our standard answer for everything. Um, I mean, it really does. I mean, there's, you know, twice as much money in the subpart two program as there is in subpart one. So that means more of the funds are being administered locally. Uh, but we also have states that may have, you know, a couple hundred school districts and maybe only three or four of them are actually running subpart two programs. So where the location of the provision of services happens, kind of depends on, you know, the, the nature of the state. You know, we've got, but, but it's the same is true of education services generally. Um, you know, there's a different, you know, you take a state like, say, Illinois, which has, you know, several hundred school districts, but something like 60% of the students in the state are in one district. So, you know, they've got teeny weeny little districts that probably aren't going to be running local um, neglected and delinquent programs because they just don't have the capacity to do that. Um, so how it, what it looks like and what the distribution looks like is really going to depend on, on how the state has set up its structure both for neglected and delinquent students. And when you get into um, rural districts, I used to oversee that program too. We give out over 4,000 grants for um, rural education and each district is so, so different as to how they use their funds based on the size of the district. The district may consist of 100 students overall, K through 12. 
so how they, what we call, reap their funding. You think about, look at their Title II Part A funds and what they get for Title I Part A. They're, they're being very creative with their funding sources to serve children who may be homeless, especially in that area. Um, funding they may use, thinking about how they're going to develop their teachers to teach their students. So it depends. <laughs> And, May we and, ask and question? Question. how they're using their funds. So we had a state present at the national conference, and they've actually been directly using their funds in facilities to train um, teachers in their programs to the point where now the students are outperforming on tests better than uh, all the students in the state. And so they've really directed it in a way that now uh, students feel so comfortable and they attend their classes and are paying attention and they provide extracurricular programs within the facility um, that they're testing above all the students in the state. I can't remember where, which publication right now, but just recently I saw an article to that effect and thought, holy mackerel, that's fantastic, yeah. We were debating as to which state it was. We can't remember. <laughs> oh. Hello, can you this hear me? Observation. Um, when you mentioned about the national level partnerships, at HHS we have an interagency working group on youth programs, and I believe the Department of Education does is a member of that. And so it would be great to, through that to be linked because the, the group covers 22 federal agencies and departments and uh, does a lot of work across the systems to make everybody aware of the different programs. And if you're not linked into that, we'd love to have you participate so that we're sharing all this information across federal departments. So just want to point that out. So why don't we share contact information after just to make sure we are active members of the Interagency Council on Homelessness because um, Assistant yes. Secretary Brogan is serving as the chair. Yes. So there's a meeting after this meeting later <laughs> today yes. regarding that. And then I know my, one of my other staff, Brian Thurman, works closely with individuals from HHS for foster care. So let's make sure we're tied okay. in. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? We have some questions on the from our folks on the phone. So let's see, is Lark on the phone? If you would just hit star six and feel free to ask your question. Lark Hello. 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 This is Maura Corrigan from Michigan. Can you hear me? Yes. I have a question about the new federal statute, the Families First Prevention Act, uh, which makes huge changes in uh, child welfare in terms of federal funding around congregate care. It severely limits the federal reimbursement for congregate care except for certain very specific exemptions. That will affect all the state's ability to draw down money for children, neglected children and institutions. Are you working with anyone from the Children's Bureau to change definitions either right in a regulatory sense or looking at potential amendments uh, in order to be consistent with the new FFPSA? Who are you directing your question to, Ms. Morgan? I'm not sure who to ask the question to. I'm wondering whether you're familiar with that and, and whether there's been any outreach to the Children's Bureau at HHS to work through these issues. The act doesn't really kick in. A lot of states won't be working or, or realizing this for two more years, but the um, implications are tremendous, uh, I think. And um, I'm just wondering 
if, if any of you um, are, are aware of it and um, whether any work is being done on that front to coordinate. All right, uh, Brenda. Okay, um, this is Brenda Destro. I'm with the Department of Health and Human Services, and um, we are within the Administration for Children and Families in the Children's Bureau. I know that the um, the agency is working very hard now on the implementation of this um, new legislation. As you've pointed out, and as we're well aware, it's very complicated, and it is going. It's taking an enormous amount of time at the Children's Bureau to try to reconcile some of the, the issues that you're raising. Uh, so I just want to assure you we're working on it very hard and, um, and certainly as it affects programs at education and other departments, um, we're, we're aware of that, but right now it's kind of just reconciling some of the definitions and the data and it's, uh, it's a roll up your sleeves, all hands on deck effort now by the Children's Bureau. So I think more information will be coming soon. And um, But you have our assurances that we're working on it and understand the, the issues you have in Michigan and the other states with congregate care. Okay, thank you. Is Mark? Thank you. Mark Hong from SAMHSA, I think you have a question. Just hit star six and unmute your phone. Hello, this is Lark. Hey, Lark. Yes. yes. Hi. Oh, great. Thanks. Uh, well, thanks for that really informative presentation. I have a question in terms of, uh, this is Lark from SAMHSA. I have a question in terms of how funds can be spent. You mentioned that, that uh, they could be spent for counseling as well. And I imagine that these children that are designated neglected and delinquent have a lot of other mental health, some issues, other kinds of social emotional learning issues. Can funds be spent for treatment, for mental health care or treatment, or some choose treatment? Um, the focus of the Title I Part D funding is on educational services. Um, so, you know, it's not really intended for for mental health care. It's more the counseling that is funded through Title One Part D is more educational counseling rather than mental health uh, service counseling. But the the focus of the program is provision of education services. So uh, we think question. about the impact of social emotional learning kids with trauma histories and interference with educational capacity, that can't be included in terms of support for educational goals? Probably the social emotional learning, uh, but the focus of, the, of the, um, the expenditure needs to be on the education service part of it. So to the extent that that kind of professional development or training for teachers and counselors Serves the you know the primary point of it is is uh, enhancing the the students' uh, um, ability to achieve in the state academic content standard. Uh, yeah, it probably would be allowable. This would be the kind of thing that we would certainly suggest if there's a particular agency that wants to use funds in that way that they would contact their their state Title One Part D director and and have that conversation about what the focus of that expenditure would be, but. Keeping in mind that the primary purpose of this is is enhancing the the students' intellectual um, and educational attainment. Great, thank you very much. Great question, thank you. Anyone else have a question? Yeah. I have a question. Uh, some, some, oh, I'm sorry. Someone on the phone have a question? Some of the I mean, intricacies of this act and the parts and the subparts and what money goes where and what has to all the hoops that have to be jumped through. Um, does the state agency, the state DOE, uh, will there they have somebody in there? I'm assuming that is completely knowledgeable on all of these things and can assist the designated state agency or the SAC state advisory group that uh, addresses juvenile delinquency 
we're trying really hard to get recommended SACs that they take that, so they find somebody in their state Department of Education and put them on the SAC so that, that this conversation is inclusive. Everything they talk about uh, with the delinquency population will include this. Is that is there a person that's as knowledgeable as you all are in <laughs> each uh, state? Each state has a Title I Part D director. The caveat that I would give to that is in many states, that person has four other jobs. Um, you know, if you're in a state whose subpart one grant is $86,000, you're not going to be spending all of your time on Title I Part D. A lot of our state directors are also the director for the McKinney-Vento Homeless Program. They may be the Title IV director. They may be the Title II director. They may be all of those things. So, I mean, I, I think as far as, as participating in the SAG, I mean, when you presented at our NDTAG meeting in the summer, they were all very excited about this. But, you know, what we were hearing from them after is, I don't know if I have time to do this. You know, I, I, they want to. It's not, it, but, it's a capacity issue, and, and frankly, it's a capacity issue for us, too, because we also have, you know, four other jobs. Uh, so, you know, it's a small program, and in most states, the person who is the Title I director, that is not his or her sole duty. Karen, how often do they meet? It's monthly? Pardon me? How often do those committees meet statewide monthly? You know, it depends. Depends. It depends from state to state, but it can be quarterly. It can be... Um, Finally, some are more active or, or meet more often than others. The, all the participants on the committee have mm -hmm. full-time jobs. It, it's something that they are they do to serve for a particular time. I, I, I don't think it, as a time commitment goes, that it would end up being that number mm -hmm. for, for anyone. Um, I hope not anyway. That's something we'll have to explore. It just, to me, it's such an important connection for our mm -hmm. staff make with the State Department of Education and, and to understand mm -hmm. the funds that are available for uh, education for average kids and for kids that are already involved. Yeah. Um, I, we'll just, I guess we'll talk more about this. I know. <laughs> yeah, we'll. We'll do that because I think the one coordinator, I don't remember what state she was from, she kept attending the meeting until finally they put her on the, um, on the committee or the board or whatever. So we do have those who do have the bandwidth, but they're just overly zealous and they make the time. But um, this is definitely maybe a conversation we can follow up with when, the, when ND Tech meets with the state coordinators, perhaps as an agenda item because they've had time between now and the conference but they do wear those multiple hats, but it is important. Um, additionally, this is more of a comment, I think, than a question, but we just uh, recently began training our facility superintendents, correctional facility superintendents, and I think that's long overdue. I uh, didn't realize they didn't have a national training program, but I think a part of this information about funds that are available and for corrections, for things that go on in corrections, as something we'll certainly want to incorporate in our training and just to increase their education, hopefully. Uh, I can't remember, honestly, that there's already a, a component in the curriculum that deals with this or not, but there will be going forward. And we would love to participate in perhaps uh, one of those trainings to inform them of the educational component of Title I Part D. We talked about that with Sherry and Tanine. Oh, perhaps the one of the next steps participating. So that would be great. Maybe we can put that in the plan. Mm -hmm. Anything else? We're probably going to need to come get next to a microphone. <laughs> okay. Hi. My name is Akia. I'm a, a lawyer. I feel compelled to start by saying my thoughts, my questions are my own and not a reflection of uh, my firm. Uh, can you, well, Obama uh, mentioned how uh, the devastating effects of father absentee is on youth, delinquent youth in particular, uh, making a child who grows up in a home without a father five times more likely to be poor, nine times more likely to 
um, drop out of school and 20 times more likely to end up behind bars. Um, can you uh, talk about any state agencies that has uh, directed your funds towards combating father absentees, whether A, the youth fathers or youth who are actually fathers themselves to kind of um, undermine that generational delinquency that we see in a lot of, a lot of families. Um, this team's only been in existence for a couple of months, okay. and we don't know of anything or any state right now that has specifically addressed your question. Okay. okay. But I, I do have past experience working in the juvenile justice system, and so D.C. actually has a mentorship program, and so they make sure that youth are connected to a mentor after they leave facilities. And so it may not address father absenteeism directly, um, but just having somebody in the community to help support them afterwards is one of the things that I'm not – they may not be using Title I Part D funds for, but that is something that they prioritize in their state. And so there are states that are, are doing things. I'm not sure how much of Title I Part D funds they're using, as FOSMA has indicated, but we will explore that a little more. And another program which may be doing something in that area, maybe like 21st Century Communities or some funds from Title IV that you may want to research. Okay, or we can inquire, too, on your behalf. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hi, good morning. Um, Maria Lana Quinn from the Department of Housing and Urban Development. In fact, a way in from a different agency. Um, so several years back, we in fact launched our HUD Father's Day initiative, which focused on addressing those concerns and, and helping um, low-income children um, and fathers um, and provide them the support that they need. Um, we have since then expanded that initiative to date to what we refer to as the Strong Families Initiative focused on fathers, but also mothers, parents, guardians, and uh, caring adults who are um, necessary to support the needs of low-income children. So we are, in fact, doing that, and we collaborate with several of your agencies to do that. And I'm, uh, as I'm sitting, I'm thinking, it was also, and some of you probably are familiar with this, a Big Brother initiative that may have addressed specifically um, the father area with support for neglected or delinquent children or youth. But when we get back, we can do some additional dive in into the question. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, I think it's time to move on to our next presenter. I'm really excited about this and so happy uh, to welcome if you, are you going to do it from your desk? That's fine. Are you going to do it from the podium? That's fine. Whatever you want to do is fine with me. I want to introduce to you Clyde Van Dyke from Johnson City, New York. He is the 4-H National Youth in Action uh, for 2019. He won that award, the National Youth in Action Award for 2019, and the HughesNet-sponsored Youth in Action Pillar Award for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. Uh, he was told at a young age that he wouldn't graduate from high school or ever be successful. He faced a lot of challenges, and he didn't really have the support that he needed, and he lacked some confidence to get out of his comfort zone. Uh, but then he went to a 4-H Tech Wizards After School Mentoring Program. I love that. 4-H Tech Wizards After School Mentoring Program. <laughs> Part of the 4-H National Mentoring Program funded through OJDP. His life changed in a drastic way. Uh, he learned to communicate, collaborate, and be a leader. Uh, in, and was introduced to, and you're going to have to tell us what this is, because I have no idea, the in, a geospatial program. Oh, that yeah. Allows to create maps and visualize data and spark action in the community. He's got so much going on, he's going to just uh, blow us all out of the room. So if you would, please welcome Clyde Van Dyke. <laughs> How's everyone doing today? Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. All right. So good morning. My name is Clive Van Dyke, and I am the 2019 4-H Youth in Action STEM and National winner. Boy, that's a very long title for me, but it's so great to be able to say it out loud. <laughs> there really are no words that can fully express my gratitude to OJJDP and 4-H 
because my life would have looked very different if I haven't been if I hadn't been welcomed into the 4-H family. I have this, my club, my mentors, and all the volunteers who have supported me on my journey to think for providing me with experiences that have changed my life so profoundly. Early on, the world told me I want to be successful. There were just too many roadblocks on the way to success. My dad dropped out of high school. I lost my mom at the age of three. My dad still struggles to cope even to this day. My sixth grade guidance counselor told me that often African Americans and Hispanics, like me, don't graduate from high school. Hearing this, this discouraged me so much and I gave up on my schoolwork, just giving up on my confidence as a whole, assuming all I could hope to be was another statistic. In seventh grade, I sat down in my homeroom, just like how we're all sitting down right now, just thinking about where my life would be in the future, where I would be in the future, where would I be doing, where would I be going. But then something unexpected and incredible happened. A friend invited me to the 4-H Tech Wizards program in my hometown of Johnson City. So it was um, hosted downtown, so very central to where I lived. Only about five minutes away is a little bit of a walk, but it was okay. <laughs> and doing this, everything changed. This program, funded by a grant from OJJDP, gave me a chance to learn about the incredible opportunities that there are in the STEM field. And for those that do not know what STEM stands for, it stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. <laughs> and for the first time in my life, I had a caring adult mentor who was willing to invest in me. My mentor, Kelly Adams, she's over there, by the way, so yeah. wave hi to her. Hey, hi, Kelly. Kelly. <laughs> hi. She's, she's here with me, and I can tell you that without her, my life would not be on the upward path that it is right now. Um, where am I? Oh, right here. Um, all because Kelly and my other 4-H leaders told me that they believed in me and wanted to see me thrive. Now to give you some background on what we did in the program. In the 4-H Tech Wizards program, I participated in many team-based projects and even started leading some activities myself. I was hooked. I was on the edge of my seat, living my best life. Just a little seventh grader, living his best life in a little church downstairs, conducting a whole, lot, a whole bunch of activities. Oh, so much fun. As I progressed in the program, the adults and volunteers leading the program started introducing me and my peers to life skills. And I started to see those skills and how they could be powerful when it came to school. In the next year of the program, my peers and I learned about the skills behind learning. We had a lot of fun doing the next activity, so we did sewing projects, computer science activities, coding a robot, that sort of thing. Doing these activities, we were amazed about learning the skills and character attributes we were learning just by participating in these activities. Not a lot of kids know that you're getting some life skills out of doing just the simplest things like writing in a book, that sort of thing. So there's definitely some um, purpose when the teacher's asking you to do something. And before 4-H, I did not know that at all. I just thought they wanted to waste my time. <laughs> <clears throat> this program changed my perspective on school and how I should look at my education. I did not have to be a statistic. I did not have to give up on my education and I did not have to be a dropout. Not everyone gets the opportunity to learn, and not everyone has the support they need to even graduate from high school. But armed with this new perspective and the support of adults who cared about my success, I walked into the next few years of my educational career with a new mindset and a determination to try my hardest in school. I'm proud to say that now, because of 4-H and the adults who have supported me, I am not a dropout. Recently in June, I graduated from Johnson City High School, and I am starting my freshman year in the State University of New York at Dell High. So that's going well for me right now. <clears throat> and at SUNY Dell High, I am majoring in computer information systems and digital forensics, a path I would have never discovered without 4-H. In elementary school, I dreamed of making a change in the world but I didn't know how. As I watched Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech, 
I was so inspired to hear him talk about unifying all people. Words that particularly impacted me because they focus on diverse backgrounds, like myself. I saw Dr. King's impact on the world around me, and I wanted to change the world for the better. My 4-H mentors helped me build the confidence and the skills I needed to do just that. Because of 4-H, I am resilient and independent. Because of 4-H, I have adults in my life that I know I can count on. Because of 4-H, I can and I will speak up, ask questions, and learn. Because of 4-H, I can work hard and go for my dreams. And because of 4-H, I can make a difference just like Dr. King and just like my mentor, Kelly. I now pay it forward by mentoring youth in elementary schools and other schools around my hometown of Johnson City, New York. Now, you guys hear me talk about Johnson City a lot. If anyone's from Tennessee, they know there's a Johnson City, Tennessee, and a Johnson City, New York. Totally different. <laughs> and usually when I tell people I'm from New York, they think New York City. That is not the case. I live three hours away from New York City. So, yeah, just to give you some perspective, I don't live in New York City in the very urban area. But it is a big city, though. <laughs> I'm also making a difference by creating geospatial maps that focus on getting community members aware of issues. This might be... Um, oh, sorry. And I, might, and I want to empower others to make a difference on issues they're passionate about, too. This might happen by creating a map on the drug overdose deaths in the continental United States, getting a community interested in rural entrepreneurship, teaching others how to live healthier, providing food for the homeless, or simply being a caring voice to someone in need. I am just one story about how 4-H is giving young people the tools they need to make a difference in their communities and ultimately the world. I could never fully define all that 4-H has done for me and where it will take me in the future. But I do know that none of this would have been possible without the support of OJJDP because without this grant, the funding, the, um, without the grant that funded the mentoring program that got me started in 4-H, I would not be here today. In elementary and middle school, no one thought I would be where I am today, most of all me. But 4-H, OJJDP, and other supporters have shown me that there are people who believe in me and my future. The mentoring program definitely impacted me in a powerful way. And with the help of supporters like you, 4-H, 4-H can continue to inspire you to be their best selves. Sorry. <laughs> um, and be, um, oh, here, sorry, lost in place. And because of the continued commitment from people like you, young people like me can become powerful change makers in our world. I am proud and so thankful that 4-H mentors in my community were committed to investing in me. No matter where I came from, no matter what the statistics said, I can change the world around me because of 4-H. Thank you for allowing me to speak to you guys today, and I will now open it up for questions or any comments. Thank you. Oh, does anybody have any questions? I'm getting, uh, <laughs> I'm going to cry listening to that. Uh, seriously, does anyone have any questions or comments? Um, the question was, is this my first time speaking publicly? Um, the answer would be no, it is not. Um, so 4-H, we have a program called um, Public Presentations, and so they really encourage, especially in our local counties, um, they encourage us to participate in public presentations, so just sharing a topic um, on anything you want to share. And so this is my, um, oh boy, Kelly could probably vouch for this. It's about my fifth year doing a public presentation, and I've just done a whole bunch of public speaking ever since then. So yes, this is definitely not my first time. <laughs> oh yes, I I get a lot of people that tell me that. By the way, <laughs> good morning. This is Natasha McMurray from ONDCP. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. 
So this is a question for both uh, our, our wonderful presenter. Congratulations on turning life around. Um, I have a friend who often asks, how are you treating life? Um, and it sounds like you're treating life well as well as life is treating you well. Um, but for our folks at OJJDP, which are the which was the funding stream that supported the 4-H program? I know a few years ago there was JUMP, which was Juvenile Mentoring Program, and a few other mentoring grants. But which one is the um, fund that supported the 4-H program? It's our general mentoring funding stream, and then it goes out into a couple of larger uh, grants and then into a series of sub-grants. Jim, is that right? It's just our big mentoring block of money. Okay, thank you. I am just so impressed. You're welcome. I am so, so impressed with you, Clark. It's amazing. Work. Thank you. And Kelly, is that Kelly? Thank you so, so much for for participating with 4-H and for being a mentor. This must make you just. I can't imagine how you feel when you see this young man and this unbridled potential about to be unleashed on the world um, <laughs> and, and knowing that, that you were able to come alongside him and help him out a little bit. Well, we definitely um, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, we worked with the uh, 4-H Tech Wizards mentoring program for seven years uh, in multiple sites, and Clyde was in the program for three of those four years and then moved into 4-H uh, club-based programming. And so to watch him grow over the five years that he was in the program is absolutely amazing, uh, knowing that we had the ability to offer many opportunities to the youth through the funding from OJJDP uh, really has made a huge difference in the youth in our community. So super excited to watch Clyde as he begins his, well, actually continues his college career as he was taking college courses in high school as well. Um, so, you know, he's two weeks in and getting hundreds and having a great time and making friends and just the, the opportunity for him to come and speak to you and, and show you how the program has uh, impacted him has been absolutely amazing. So we look forward to seeing how much further he goes. Thank you. Uh, Can I? Yeah. yeah. Um, you're, you have an amazing story and we're all very impressed and happy with your accomplishments. But as policymakers, we have to take what happened to you and translate it into a program mm -hmm. of some, time, uh, some kind or another. Can you help us understand how this program is, at some time in your life made a difference that can help us as we try to build that experience and scale it across various programs? Yeah, I'm glad, that, I'm glad that you asked that type of question. So um, with the Tech Wizards program, what we would do is we would um, do our weekly activity. So we would pick a category in STEM. So um, for example, one week would be computer science. And we would look at um, different modules in the LEGO Mindstorm curriculum. So we would look at curriculums um, and base it off of that. But we had um, many ways of exploring our own ways. And then also um, with the 4-H Tech Wizards program, we focus on going on field trips and and exploring different careers in STEM. So definitely uh, with the Tech Wizard program, what definitely changed my life is seeing the opportunity. So being offered like the different amount of field trips and being offered the time to go to this um, lab to see what they're doing, that's what definitely changed me and gave me a new perspective on what I can do. So. Um, for a potentially new program, something like that, I would focus in investing in youth and providing them with the different opportunities to check out the different careers. Because once you check out those careers, that's definitely going to get them interested into pursuing that career further. And then um, they can go into the Tech Wizard program or any mentoring program further, and they can ask their mentor, how do I explore, um, for example, computer science? What do I need to learn in order to um, be up on top of my game when I want to enter that field. So uh, just providing youth the insight in these careers is going to give both mentors and the mentees the tools that they need to collaborate with one another and just to create a better world that we live in. If I could just follow up and just yeah. say from what you, um, just to help, help me understand a little bit. So 
caring people like your mentor and took the time to ex you know expose you to different things to help you find what you were passionate about and then build on that would that be a fair yes. assessment okay all right thank you Hi, and this is Natalia McMurray again from ONDCP. So for years we have known the elements of uh, effective mentoring programs and how that impacts the lives of youth. And some of the common elements that we know are the ability to have one-on-one uh, -on -one or a small group to small, or one mentor to a small group uh, interaction in the same way we know that that's helpful in the class setting and the educational setting. Um, but and as um, our presenter mentioned, the opportunity to be exposed to new things, to have someone who's um, negating the negative talk, that the negative self-talk and the negative talk uh, uh, from um, environments with high risk factors, et cetera. One of the challenges I think um, that we need to think through is that we know mentoring works. Um, a lot of people have put money into mentoring programs, but there's still a huge gap. And typically the gap is we have uh, a thousand different mentoring programs all searching for more mentors um, and so we keep putting more money into more programs but the, but the thing that's often missing is the need for more mentors and what makes folks mentor um, and makes them available to mentor and this would be a great question to ask the, the mentor kind of why you know what compelled you how were you attracted how were you trained how were you um, incentivized to, 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 to mentor but one of the things I think we think about is uh, folks are so busy and there's not too many incentives for people to give up of their time. Uh, one of the examples that I, I always like to lift up is in Alexandria, Virginia, a couple of administrations ago, um, mayoral administrations ago, the mayor at the time, Bill Yule, thought it was so important for um, the cadre of thousands of city staff to be involved in the lives of their uh, children and their community that he made it so that every, I think it was every week or every other week, they had an hour of community service time available to them, leave for community service. So you could take your hour and mentor, an hour and tutor, that hour, et cetera, and it made it available across the city. And so you had thousands of folks who are, you know, educated, working, positive, and, and um, interested in investing in the lives of children. Uh, we at ONDCP actually mimicked that a couple of years ago. I don't even know if that's actually still available now, but we're able to take, um, they, they created a leave category called community leave or community service leave where we could take an hour every other week um, and use that hour to do something community service oriented. So as a policy, we may want to think about, you know, are there ways that we can incentivize uh, people to be more generous with their time, to be able to provide that one-on-one -on -one information, instruction, compassion, uh, exposure, et cetera, that is so vital uh, because there's millions of people who are out there but don't and have something to offer but don't often have the opportunity or the incentive. And maybe even with, if, even if we thought about the federal government, you know, the, the millions of people who work in federal government that would love to do more, um, is there a way that we incentivize and make that a part of what we offer to the public that we serve? People who are compassionate, intelligent, have much to offer and now have an incentive and an opportunity to serve uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. All right, thank you. Maria, do you have a question? I do, thank you. Again, Maria Lana Queen from HUD. Um, Clyde, thank you for sharing your story. It's very inspirational, um, motivational. Congratulations for pursuing college and enrolling. Um, I, I want to say at HUD, we actually administer a program known as Project SOAR. So it, stands for students plus opportunities plus achievements equals results. And what we focus on is providing low-income students with education navigators to help them complete the free application for federal student aid known as FAFSA. Yeah. So that's financial aid. And we do that because research shows that vulnerable low-income young people uh, would be going to college, but they can't, they don't have the access to opportunities to complete the FAFSA. It's very complicated. You need to have a computer. You need to be online. You need to possibly have a navigator or mentor. My question is, if I could ask, did you pursue the FAFSA route for your tuition and or were you able to access scholarships? And I'm, I'm just speaking because I think it's great. College is expensive either way. The financial piece of it is important, 
Um, yet we know that without that support, again, oh, it's yeah. like nav navigating through this complicated system. We provide education navigators. We fund education navigators to help students do this and to help their families. Um, but perhaps their mentors like Kelly obviously was involved. What was your route, if I could ask? Yeah, what was no your problem. experience with that? It's a great question. So I did pursue the um, FAFSA track because I knew that um, even with, if I did receive scholarships like from different organizations and stuff, I would still need support in order to pay for college. So filling out FAFSA was something I definitely did. October 1st, I was on it. <laughs> and so, um, and I know in my local area, there's um, like in my school-wide district, we do offer um, help with filling out FAFSA, but hearing about the program that you're talking about, that'd be great to see in more communities because I know with my friends, like, because um, we're coming from the south side of Johnson City, which is known to be um, low-income driven families, and there's a lot of um, my friends and stuff like that talking about how they struggled to do the FAFSA because they didn't understand it, they needed the resources and access. So hearing about the program that you guys do in HUD, that'd be a great way to implement it in more communities, and I think it's a great program. And um, as far as scholarships, um, when I won the National 4-H Award, that came with a, um, when I won the STEM Pillar Award, that came with a $5,000 scholarship. And then out of the four pillar winners, one of us was chosen as the national winner, and I received the national award. So I got an additional 5000 so that's 10000 altogether. And that has helped out majorly in college. And so that's also some of the um, support and funding that I've received to help me um, pursue college as a whole. So that's great, um, and thank you so much. So my second question is, are you available to to come on the road and to join, come to our federal agencies to speak with leadership and other career staff members who are attempting to meet um, the needs of young people and to do ex and to help young people do exactly what you did. Um, maybe you have a we can exchange point of contact. That's Absolutely, what I was just <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I think it's wonderful. Congratulations. Just Thank keep you. up the great work. Yep, I will. We'll definitely have yep, to exchange Absolutely. Information. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, Clyde, does anyone else have any questions? Brief comment. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, I had no idea that 4-H had come so far since I was a child. Uh, mostly I, I uh, recall it being associated with agricultural oh, activity, yeah. old school 4-H. <laughs> uh, second, I, I was very pleased to, to hear or at least thought I heard you speak of geoforensics. Is that correct? Um, not for not geoforensics, just geospatial sciences. So just making maps as a whole, not analyzing the forensic side of geospatial. Sure. From my point of view, for me, that means that relates to forensics. But it's, it's for us been so critical in the last ten to fifteen years, as you alluded to, to addressing the public health crisis that uh, is involved with the uh, opioids, the criminological problems associated with that, and it is so interesting to me to hear a young person uh, speak of those kinds of issues and the tremendous value it brings to certainly the mission of the Department of Justice, uh, certainly uh, the Center for Disease uh, yeah. uh, Control, just uh, has made an awesome difference in what we've been able to do nationally to address some of these problems. And then I, I think I just also wanted to comment uh, for those uh, people who are familiar, unless it's changed, um, with the, if I recall, the pledge of 4-H, if all of us would simply um, uh, individualize that to do the types of things that you have done. You are living the pledge. It is so impressive. And thank you for being here today. Thank you. I was just going to say, um, I want to get your mentor's contact information. I don't know if you are aware there are internship opportunities throughout the federal government at various times. I have an intern with me, there she is, <laughs> today, and I'm always looking for opportunities to take on students. Um, at the Department of Ed as interns, as my staff know, they all have opportunity to supervise a mentor, uh, a mentor or a young student in college. I don't know if SUNY participates, but let's make sure we have each other's contact information. 
and say you may have to battle with Google. They've already offered him some internships. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't think we this. could I'm go. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but thanks to throw my hat in already. <laughs> but just knowing those opportunities are there. That's great that That's Google awesome. is looking at. It really has opened many opportunities for him, so thank you. You're very welcome. And I, too, had um, my children in 4-H, so just a really, really great program. 4-H. You don't have to have a cow to be in 4-H. Everybody yeah. that gets that cow and goes to the county, the, the county fair every year or, or make preserves or do any of that. It is not about that. I mean, it is about that, but it is about so much more than that. And it's sure. it just such a tremendous uh, place for kids to, to get grounded, to get, get a hold of what they want to do and get support for that and find, and find their feet. Wow, Clyde, you are, you're like a, aside from being a breath of fresh air, you're also like a shot in the arm of <laughs> and, and renewing. Why are we doing this? Why we're doing this? Oh, this is, what a tremendous presentation. Thank you so very much for coming Thank out. you. I have a feeling we're going to be fighting among ourselves. <laughs> Who's going to work with you next? Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. All right. Gracious. All right. Um, I think that's about it. Our next meeting is December 10th. That is on a Tuesday, not normal Thursday, because we couldn't get this room on our normal Thursday. So it'll be on Tuesday, December 10th, from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. I know that's a good change as well, but we had to do it when the uh, when the room was available. So with that, are we about done? I think we are done, and this meeting is officially closed. Thank you for participating. Thank you, everyone. I look forward to receiving your list of... <laughs>